Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. I'm so excited today. We This is funny because we are on Zoom, but we are all three of us are in Colorado. I'm welcoming some super varsity female financial powerhouses to the Turmeric and Tequila mic. You know, if you listen to Turmeric and Tequila, we've talked about money and youth, money and um, families, money and generational narrative. But today we're going to be talking about women and money. It's extremely taboo for females. It's for every, it's taboo for anyone to say, you know, how much do you make and then talk about it in the workplace, but women and money is still a funny thing. So I like that. I have these two bosses that are super familiar with the wealth and management game and having these hard conversations. So they're going to give us like pro tips on what to do, maybe where to put our money, um, maybe when to put our foot in our mouth <laughs> and, um, kind of how they got into it. So, and bonus, they have a podcast. So if you like this conversation, which you will, you should go check out, um, their podcast about finance. It's called The Naked Call. And I'm reading it off, off their website. This is how much I love it. It says the podcast is unexpected in the best way. At the core, it is a fresh perspective on what it means to be rich, focused on empowering listeners to live their best lives in whatever way that means for them. There is a fierce lineup of guests that contribute to conversations that may not even, uh, that may not, may or may not even mention wealth. We like to say we are the podcast about money that doesn't actually talk about money. I love it. Mm -hmm. So Annie Kaiser in Chandler Tevaldi. Yep. American Tequila. Ah, what a great <laughs> intro. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. So mm -hmm. excited. Hearing our website read back to us makes me feel so good. That's good is, copy. Isn't that <laughs> Um, that's funny you say that because as a semi coach ish, I always tell people, I'm like, if you're starting a company or a business or whatever, go get like, do it all, but then get a sticker, get something in print, see it, and then go back to your content and read it out loud. And it's like something about it just makes it real. You also just, you know, since we're laying on the compliments to each other, you have an impeccable podcasting voice and flow. So, well, well thank you. I, <laughs> the stumbling over my words and I hate reading aloud. So this has like been such a good personal, um, exercise and journey and like literally stepping into the light and on the mic and la la la. So thank you received. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, so this is a super interesting story. Um, Annie is a licensed uh, financial advisor and Chandler is a certified financial planner. Uh, if you don't know what these things are, that's okay. I just, why don't each of you guys give us a little bit of your background um, and how you kind of got into the money game. You don't have to go into like, you know, I was born in whatever and go there, but just give us like kind of how we like landed in, in financial and wealth management. Awesome. Well, I will, um, I'll kick it off. Uh, so I grew up in Washington, DC. And, um, I have this really funny memory of, um, uh, being in our family Jeep at like an incredibly young age. I, I remember when like the cell phones were like kind of bricks, they weren't like the flip brick, but it was yes. like, it was like a cell phone brick, the, the gray brick, it was the gray the, brick. The, the intense antenna. I totally it, remember that. It was bigger than the Nokia, like the Nokia version anyway. Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting in <laughs> the, uh, like the passenger seat and pretending to have a conversation with my stockbroker and saying like, yeah, no, just, I, I want you to trade a million. And I have no idea like where this came from, but um, it's funny when I think about how I landed in this career because it was such a circuitous path and um, it, it, I didn't ever imagine, I could have never imagined myself landing in the, in the role that I'm in today, even though I did have that funny early memory talking about, um, slinging dollars around, but, um, manifesting, manifesting. Yeah. So, um, uh, I actually have a graduate degree in, um, in public health, um, this all was pre COVID. So, um, people were like, what is public health? Um, uh, but I, I studied behavioral health was my focus. And, um, I really am interested in health behaviors and how we 
really can set ourselves up for the most abundant, happy, healthy life. And when I was in graduate school and I actually went to, I went to Anschutz, um, I was really frustrated with the fact that nobody was really talking about money. Um, and mind you, I had actually, I had a, I had a career in the outdoor industry. Um, so I, in, in my twenties, I worked in nonprofits, um, doing sort of some like refugee resettlement work. And then in the, in the outdoor industry, I worked for an organization called the national outdoor leadership school. Um, and then landed in graduate school. Cause I was just kind of like, all oh, this sounds interesting. And while I was there, I was really frustrated with the fact that nobody was talking about how to finance all of these programs that are that are very needed for public health. And um, it kind of occurred to me that I didn't I didn't really want to stay in the public health world. It was really interesting. Um, but that's when I started to think about money as a health behavior. And um, I had a mentor at the time who was like, hey, you should work in a male dominated industry like finance, which was such a pivot, like complete pivot. I have an English lit undergrad degree and a public health degree. So it was like, whoa, but it, it felt really, it felt right. It felt like it was something that I was meant to do and that I really wanted to do. And, um, I started at a, at a large, um, wirehouse uh insurance firm based firm and had a really horrible experience there to be honest um it was not anything that aligned with transparency and quite frankly like helping people with their money um and but I kind of like paid my dues a little bit and had this moment when I was there where I realized there's not one person in this building that I would feel comfortable going to and talking to about my, my money. And, um, and that's when I knew I was like, okay, I have to, I have to get out of here. I have to go the fiduciary route for, so for people who, who don't know what that means, that's um, lots of different types of advisors out there, but the fiduciaries are, really held to the highest standard in terms of uh, legally and morally bound to make recommendations in your best interest. Um, and so that landed me here at Maya Wealth, where I've been for about three years. Um, and it's been an incredible journey. Um, I could go on, but I, I'm self-conscious that I'm still talking. No, no, that was great. Yeah. So, Let's start. Uh, I, yeah. I have so many questions, but Chandler, I want you to say your story first. I just, I, I know that the undertones of all this, which I love, and we obviously met initially before this, um, it's so core value driven. And if you listen to Ricky we talk a lot about that and wherever, like the packaging of the degree and all this, like the base of all these things and maneuvers and pivots are led by your core values. It's just like, sometimes you just don't know yet, but no matter what you that compass is kind of guiding you. So anyways, Chandler, I feel like it's going to be the same for you. <laughs> I, I think so. We have different stories, but I think we have similar core values. So yeah. we have a similar ethos. Um, I'm from Central California, not talked about a lot. I know people talk about North and South. I'm from Visalia. It's in between Bakersfield and Fresno, very agriculture heavy area. I grew up on a dairy farm. Um, and it is a very male dominated industry. And I uh, have always felt kind of like a black sheep in my family. Um, I know we don't have to talk about our relationship with family and stuff, but it is part of my whole story. There was always a really large divide of genders. Um, all the men basically who were born into it would go own dairy farms and the women um, often just married farmers. Not that that's a bad thing, but I knew that that wasn't for me from the very beginning, but I didn't have a lot of direction or like a leader who, a female leader who was doing something different. So I kind of just threw like a dart with my eyes blindfolded and went to a uh, university of Denver and decided to study finance. I thought it was a, uh, yeah, go Pios. In my mind, I thought that finance was like a legitimate degree, but hard, hard enough to be legitimate, but easy enough that I didn't have to try that hard. So, um, I went through and I did that. I started an internship at Mass Mutual, similar to Annie, like a life, a life insurance wirehouse place. Um, and I was really young, so I had no idea what I was getting into, honestly. And same situation. All the people there, I hate to generalize. There's obviously good people everywhere. 
but there was no one there that I would feel comfortable managing my own money, especially when the industry is set like 70% men. Mm -hmm. Um, and working with women is a huge passion of mine. I met my business partner, Scott and Des, when I was an intern there. And we started Maya Wealth together about five years ago. And the goal was one, to be independent. So we're fiduciaries and can act in our clients' best interests. And then two, to just be different. Like mm-hmm. the financial services industry is just filled with old habits, archaic ways of doing things. Um, a lot of the emotion is removed out of it. Annie and I talk about that all the time. Like the financial planning process can be so cut and dry and so mathematical and completely removes the behavioral piece when that's actually one of the most important pieces because people don't make decisions rationally most of the time. So if you're not tapping into that behavior side or like someone's goals or what they really want from life, you're not going to be a good advisor to them and helping them make the right decisions. So coming to terms with that and then talking to Annie, who's been here for three years, we really started partnering together about a year ago. We just realized we have the exact same mindset when it comes to planning and working with clients. And we realized we're a better team. And then we started the Naked Call because we thought everybody should hear what we have to say. I love it. Listen <laughs> to that, stepping into the light uh, yeah. in, a, in a uniform duo, which is a, such a phenomenal example in itself because women can work with women. We can support each other. Like this can be a thing. Uh, but I love so much that, you know, again, we have, we're intentional varsity humans. We're going to go to school. We're going to get the degrees. We're going to do this. But meanwhile, like even our backgrounds, like the childhood, the farm, the city, like all of it was kind of weaving this like, like platform for you guys to be disruptors in some capacity. And then it kind of came into the financial arena, which is right on time for 2022, 2023, because we're coming off uh, the pandemic. No one trusts anything with money where, you know, inflation is happening and blah, blah, blah. Like everyone's like, we're scrambling. And the most important thing and what I do a ton with my world, which is marketing and branding is humanizing the brand. Like, yes, we have these conglomerates and these huge things happening. You can plug it into a system and blah, but that's not real anymore. And especially for our young people, it's who, who owns this company? Who's doing it? What's the voice behind it? Where'd they come from? Why are they doing this? How are the investments out? Is the 501c3 actually going back to this? Or is there, you know, 80 cents on the dollar going to their CEO that's sleeping at the Ritz and eating a steak? Like what's going on? And we are in the age of transparency. Our young humans can find everything. So I always think it's a beautiful thing when I have my fellow disruptors coming up and like, we're right at the precipice when like disruption is happening and your disruptors are showing up. So that's my tangent on that. But um, I'm so curious when you guys like finally got together and you like understood that you had core values and like, we're going to do this, you know, situation in finance, were you like, we're really kind of here in a graceful way to like disrupt what's going on. And, and like you said, do something different, but like really intentionally. So. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, when I was at the, at the wire house, like I was going through this very personal, um, kind of revitalization of my personal relationship with money. And there was a lot of shame there because here I was an expert in the industry and I had some student loan debt and I realized money is messy. There's, Mm -hmm. we love to think of it as this, just like razor sharp, completely, you know, it is what it is completely quantitative, but it's this messy, messy thing. And that's to be celebrated. And, um, and I also like, we never, we never celebrate this sort of idea of rising from the ashes, right? Like this, I feel like financial success is like very polarized. You're either like really good with money and you like have money or you're really bad with money and you're destined to be poor forever and like rot in poverty hell, you know? <laughs> and, and so I think Jandler and I, um, you can tell our origin story because it's pretty funny. Um, but we were like, this is an industry that is, there's so many facets that are so human and beautiful and really lenses to the self for, for growth and community and, um, and really just like the path to, to, to like a life that we all, you know, want to build for ourselves. And I think we, we, we knew that we were both kind of on the same page, but it was one specific event that really congealed our vision and built what is now our partnership and our podcast. And I'll let Chandler tell the story. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so I always struggled with this, that I felt I needed to legitimize myself um, by just learning more and being someone who I'm really not. I'm not very serious. I'm very lighthearted and like goofy. Um, so we were going to this conference, this financial services conference, basically to try to learn more and be like professional and meet people in the industry. <laughs> uh, it was in Florida and we went there together. We, we had so much fun. And the first day of the conference, we walk up, I'm wearing, a, I think this is hilarious. I'm wearing a pink leather blazer. Yes. And he's in like <laughs> cheetah print shoes. And we just look around and we're like, one, we're two of the only women there. And everybody else is in black and gray. And we're just like, why are we even trying to pretend that our personalities are like these people? Like, yeah. And their personalities are great, but we're not actually using our strengths, which is being like fun and different and relatable Brilliant. and easy to talk to. Yeah. Um, and that's, then we went to the pool and then we yes. had some cocktails and then, yeah. <laughs> and then we, we were like, well, let's, we need to be the powerhouse of something freaking different. Like how you said yeah. a disruptor. Yeah. Honestly, I'd love that word disruptor. I never thought of us that way, but we truly are. There's, have you seen two advisors like this? I just, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> well, I think it was this idea of <clears throat> let's kick ass and take names at our job by being who we are. Yeah. And, and actually I'm going to, I'm going to quote you, you uh -oh. have this quote oh, no. on your website, which says, <laughs> send time as you feel an invoice for it as needed, which oh. is kind of aligned, right? <laughs> like be you do you and invoice as needed. Yeah. And anyway. So I think that's, and that's when it all began. I love it. I mean, like the light was just shining on the way to go. And what's funny is in an industry where it's like, you put out the resume and LinkedIn and my series seven and blah, 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 like all the things. But nowadays our young people, AKA our future leaders and future million billionaires, they're going to like, they're seeking the like, oh good, your life's a mess too. I actually trust you because I know that. So I will give you my money versus like this cold, sharp guy in a suit. That's like not going to tell you anything. And it's like, you're putting your ma money in a black bag and it disappears. And then you get a receipt. Like it's that, the, it's it, it's really like reshaping how an industry works but our young people are already there like I would never go throw my money as a 42 year old into like some super like solid you know I hate to say it male driven corporation because I'm like I don't I I mean I've been I've felt that before I'm, I'm treated different as a female and the money conversation is different as a female and even if I'm walking in with the cash it's a different conversation so it, it, you have that and some like old school stereotypes, but also again, we're in 2022 where all our, the landscape of our financial, everything is kind of up in arms. So you really need people you can trust and seeing people as humans makes you trust them. Have any of your clients come straight at you guys and been say, and said like, thank you for being so honest or thank you for being so real. Um, I, I, I think that we attract people who um uh, sort of inherently appreciate that okay uh, so they're kind of like you guys anyways oh totally yeah. and yeah yeah we have like 30 advisors too and if I've learned anything from working in this industry is people financial advisors attract it's a mirror of yeah. who their clients are truly a mirror of who they are so I think like it's true and it's so who their core values are and honestly from meeting other people's clients I've been like oh now I kind of understand you better the yeah. fact that that is a reflection of you, I get something about you. And we happen to work with a lot of people in like hair salon, med spa, like creatives mm -hmm. and like entrepreneurial entrepreneurs, kind of go-getters. Yeah. yeah. Who share our same values. So I feel like that inherently is there of like, we're on the same happens. page. We're both very open. I love it. Well, I mean, everything is energy and that's an ironic conversation in a number situation where it is very cut and dry and like there's a balance sheet and it's this, but like, if you've ever read, you know, rich dad, poor dad or anything, it's like all about your mindset around money and that's then true. your energy of like what you're attracting. So it's so funny that it's like, you almost bring in the woo to a very like science numbers based situation, but it's like, you, you need both sides of it to like really be in a successful and fulfilling situation if you're in the finance industry. I mean, uh so much of what we do with our clients is really kind of create structure and clarity, honestly. Um, 
because most money is such a incredibly emotionally charged topic. I think we all have these very frayed skewed views of how we relate to our own money. And in a lot of ways, we are this kind of like, you know, very safe mirror to reflect back to people. Okay. This is a, this is like sort of what you're doing and where it's going. And these are what you say are important to you. Um, and and this is what you have to do to get to where you say you want to go. And this is where we see the the dissonance. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, obviously investing, making smart investment choices is, is a huge part of what we do too. But in some ways, the harder part is um, really helping people save themselves from themselves mm-hmm. <laughs> in a lot of ways. It's like a coach. Totally. There's yeah. so much. And this is where you kind of go back to how behavior is so humans. Uh, we're so irrational. Like there's yeah. just one thing is for sure is that we are irrational. I mean, I was reading an article the other day about um, the down, like the problem with financial forecasting is that it's just, there are too many incredibly unknown variables to really actually know what the hell is going to happen, which right, in some ways right. I'm like throwing the crux of what we do under the bus but you just don't know like like there's just so many people our behavior can be so erratic (laughs) and so we're we're behavior managers in a lot of ways I love that when you started up in in, or you were in behavioral health so ironically like so much of that does fit in and I loved in our in our initial conversations you said you know I really wanted I saw public health and what was going in all the all the things that needed to change but what cultivates change well money and it's almost like you have to go out get out of it fundraise yourself do something and then go in and disrupt and I think that holds true for better or for worse now where sometimes the answer isn't to be in the industry and try and disrupt it it's to go get the capital as Lauren Hell says if you can get the money you get the power you go get the capital and then forge it your own way Um, was that kind of part of the motivation for both of you guys Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I worked in the nonprofit space because I grew up in DC, a lot of public service, um, which led me into the the kind of nonprofit route. And I was like, wait a minute, like I can have way more of an impact if I get out of this space, which there there are lots of wonderful things about the nonprofit space. But um, I had this aha moment where I was like, I want to, I want to manage my time. I want to be in charge of my time. I want to know that I can make as much money as I really like want and can, yeah. can achieve. And, and that if having giving back and is a core value of mine and I can make more money and have more time doing something like this, then hell yeah, I'm going to do it. I love it. But I and think it- the key piece there is self-efficacy when we're talking about behavior change is believing really really believing not like and I'm not manifesting great but like believing that you can achieve the thing that you set out to do which is a journey 100 yeah. percent. yeah I love that and I think particularly for like the younger listeners the path is so not a straight line and it's this is something I've had to learn time and time again like you just really do have to believe in like the end game but also trust the process because it sometimes it webs and it weaves and you're like what the f like what how, how does this make sense and then you fast forward 20 years and you're like oh my god that teed me up perfectly for exactly what I do now and what I do now didn't even exist back then so it's like sometimes you just have to let go and kind of go with it but I completely agree the belief and like the self belief belief is so deeply critical and there's no conversation to our young people around money. It was minimal. They're actually pretty awesome. Like, you know, youth programs happening in Colorado and nationally to to teach financial skills to our young kiddos. Um, But I certainly didn't grow up with like a conscious conversation of finances or anything like that. So just creating the conversation around it is so critical. Um, Tell us, which is the podcast, tell me like, what is tell us about the naked call. Obviously you guys talk about money, but not really like, what is the primary focus and what's like the end game or the goal with your podcast? Honestly, I think <clears throat> we really want to instill confidence in people to be able to be their most genuine selves and know they can go out there and they can earn money. And it's okay to want to earn money is also a big part of what we do. Um, and you can find work or something out there that aligns with your values, whether that's the corporate route, whether that's an entrepreneurial route, we're interviewing people who are doing that, who are living to their core values, very similar to you and earning their money that way. 
um, and talking about what financial success means to them and the different emotions and tactics and self pieces that go into that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that it's just expanding the dialogue around money. Right. And um, really there's the shame game around money and like what we should be, especially for women, I think Mm -hmm. is so pervasive and it like trickles into our subconscious, whether we know it or not. And the naked call is really about deconstructing narratives around, again, what you should be doing, um, what it means to be successful and challenging our listeners to do the work and define it for themselves and then have the courage and the self-confidence and the bravery to then go get it. Yeah. And we're going to cheerlead all like we're, we are here cheerleading along the way. Well, I think it's so, I love that because I think it's so critical. Like as you know, when you're younger, you've got dance lessons in school and you've got a hundred coaches and teachers and parents and like all these people guiding the path. And then we get older and we kind of like graduate out of that, but we're still like equally as clueless. And there's like more complex problems coming at us. So I think it's the best advice I could give to anyone would be like, get a nutritional coach, get a finance coach, get a fitness coach, get a business coach, get a mentor, like get all these things because as you're growing up and or you're grown or you're, or you're an adult, ideally you're still learning new things. And if you're not, that's a problem. You're going to get old fast and need Botox sooner. You have to like <laughs> stay pushing the limit, but like with that, you're going to be failing a lot. So you need coaches, you need financial things. And it's, so much easier when you don't have to figure out everything yourself I'm the absolute worst about that and asking for help and I'll figure it out because part of me just wants to know but you waste so much time because even if I went and studied and did all the financial things I'll never know what you know I'll never have the experience you have like it just makes sense to like build your personal team um tell me what you guys think if, if someone's listening and they haven't done any sort of anything with anything financial what would be like good first steps if they've got a little bit of savings or they want to connect with you guys what would be a good first step to connect with you guys or to like kind of get their mind and or money right to take that next step Ooh, there are a couple ways. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I, I'm just gonna go with what one one thing, and then I'm sure Chandler has a different a different idea. I think think about before we talk about any tactics. If you if you're if you're inclined to do something with your money or you want you have a vision, I would write that down and really think about why. Like, what do you what do you want your money to do for you? Um, and that's a little bit woo, but I love it. I think that it's an, imp- I think that it's important to identify your goals and your why, and then implement the tactic. But yes. if you don't know what those goals are and you just want to make sure that your money is doing something for you, Chandler, you try it. Well, see, that's where my brain goes. Yeah. <laughs> my brain first goes, save something systematically. That's truly like the way you're going to build wealth as boring and lame as it is, just start, even if it's 50 bucks a month, just save something somewhere systematically so that you're squirreling something away, one for an emergency fund, a rainy day, or your retirement. Um, And obviously you can get really specific and granular with your goals and how you invest towards them. And that's our whole job is talking about that. And we love going through that with our clients. Step one to reaching out to us is scheduling a phone introduction, make sure before wasting anybody's time, like a quick call to make sure we can service you that you, we like you as a client. We've always said that in our planning process. Step one is that we both like each other. Yeah. Whenever you're looking for an advisor or someone for your personal team, like you say, to me, step one, like the person and they like you. Otherwise you're never going to have respect for their opinions or whatever they have to offer you. Yeah. It's a long-term relationship. Mm-hmm. We're, we're in it for the long haul with people. So it's uh, you want to definitely want to like the other person. It's very intimate. You don't want to be intimidated yeah. by that. I mean, so many, so many of my girlfriends, they're intimidated by their advisors or they're just using their dad's advisor, which is totally fine, <laughs> whatever, but go find someone you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the amount of times I've heard from girlfriends of like, oh, I just need to run this by my dad, my boyfriend. Like, okay, why do you need this male approval? Like, it's great to have people to lean on for their advice, but yeah, you don't need the male eye to approve. Yeah, no, I I feel like we could definitely- I could talk talk about about that that forever. Just one small tip about people who have some money, I would say, um, 
when you get paid, put the money away first, set it up, just set it and forget it. Um, because I, if it's just taken out of your account, then you don't know it was there. So yeah, Simple and I, easy. I like that you guys say it's a long term because I think that's again strategic partnerships really need to be mutually beneficial. But like that core value, like the woo side, I don't think is woo at all because it is so vulnerable. I mean, you have to know like I made a mistake, I need to withdraw everything, or I'm having a baby, or whatever. And um, I think it's funnier like I have to consult my dad or my boyfriend or my wife or whatever. I I, I just I'm top core values independence. I'm such a champion of like a team and like building whatever personal relationships, financial team, whatever. But also like your independent space, if like your spouse passed away or you no longer were talking to your family or like having that independent stability, like have the family do all the things, but like have your things, like have your space, your money, because a lot, a lot, I mean, life comes at you fast. You never know when you're going to have to handle it or you're going to have to take care of yourself. And I think people think that mindset is very negative and like, oh, I don't want to be single or divorced or, you know, whatever. But it's really, I think it's a responsibility. Like do any, like, especially your female clients, are there certain people that are like, I have my money and then I've got our money. That's the relationship money or the family money. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, this is a this is an interesting one. We really actually want to want to do an episode on yes. this. I, I I think I will say that I'll let Chandler share her thoughts. I think we have a lot of work to do as a society to move beyond the patriarchal constructs around yeah. money. There are a lot of badass bitches out there that are making great money and at the top of their career, but when it comes to their confidence around what to do with their literally but buckets of money yeah they don't yeah. they don't they default to the male in their life even if they work uh, you know as a server at Chili's you know, you know no don't you should I think it's I think and people can judge this conversation but that's why we're here I think it's really important and you can say it because it's the truth I have so many friends that are the female breadwinners they get divorced and they are now paying their Chili's server husband palimony and all the things and i'm like it needs to be called out i'm here for chilies i'm here for whatever you want to do in life you want to yeah. be stay-at-home dad i'm down the totally. thing is let's have the grown conversation of what happens if just like if you have you know fertilized embryos what do we do if one person passes away like let's get into the hard conversation because when in, it does happen or if it does happen everyone's kind of screwed over and it's like we're grown we could have had this and i'm tired of seeing my females get into this role when you worked your ass for, off for 25 years and like Totally. Now there's this, and it's like I don't know. I it could be a whole podcast, but there's my energy on that. Do you have so, like, Do you have thoughts about that? Well, something I've been feeling recently. Um, the female breadwinner, I feel like often that archetype feels they need to downplay how much money they make to their husband to kind of um, comfort their feelings that they think they might have that the husband may not have even expressed, or the partner, whoever. Um, but feel like they need to downplay you know, how well they're doing and not yeah. experience, like celebrating their wins and their successes, which is so important. So we celebrate every single success. Um, and if you feel like you have to downplay the work you're doing to your spouse, that's just so unhealthy. We're celebrating and right now. We're celebrating right yeah. now. Yes. Is that tequila? tequila? I got the tequila. And this is that seriously? No. no. Oh, so man. Not. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like to some degree, I, yeah, I could see how you could feel that way. I mean, I plan to be a great success. Yeah. Well, <laughs> girlfriend, that. you already yeah. are a success, but you're just getting started. There's so much yeah. success I happening. Have so here. much runway. Yeah. But I could definitely feel like downplaying it for the man in my life because I want to coddle them and make them feel good. And that's like the patriarchy. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I got to throw a bone though to some of my guys because I've had men in my life that were very, they would say that, be like, don't dim the light or don't do this. Or like, maybe you're with like the wrong guy if this, this, and this. Like there is like a very woke, which I don't love that word, you know, male grouping out there that gets it. And even if they're down with the female breadwinner, their stay-at-home dads, I, I told you guys, I think my mom has a swim school and every year there's more and more men stay at home, which is, I'm totally here for that. That's fine. My thing is like, just have the conversation around when, and then again, like having a coach, like, am I going to go to my CrossFit coach to learn and get advice about yoga? No. So you don't need to go get financial advice about someone that's not around or handling the money on the regular. So it just doesn't make sense. And I also do have to put the caveat that there are a lot of women that are doing Doing nothing and still getting paid half and they the men should have the conversation too so it really does go both ways yeah I mean it's I think 
for our clients that are, you know, married couples, both working, we're huge fans of separate finances, like, yeah. you know, but I think you have to think as a, you have to think as a, as a unit, as a, as a union, like as, as a single household, but, um, I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine not having, you know, right? my own, I just can't, I can't, I, I think I was telling yeah. my husband the other day, I was like, I think I can't picture a universe where this relationship would work if I didn't have my own source of income. I mean, yeah, it would yeah. be a nightmare. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to adapt, but, but it's, um, it's how, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm getting, you might have yeah. to cut this out because I might be getting well, very offensive. <laughs> I've been, I'm usually like, I'm deeply yeah. independent at my core again, but I always sit here for the team, but I've always yeah. had my own thing, my own business, my own life, my own work. Yeah. Like it's very whatever, but then I'm also on the team. So very turmeric and tequila and everything, but yeah. the, it, it doesn't, I don't think it's about, you know, it, it's the guy or the girl or whatever. I think it's just having that hard conversation and being in it. My mom was a stay at home mom forever. And she just started, just became an entrepreneur at like, oh, after 50 and started from the ground up. But I saw that narrative of like, my dad made the money, my mom didn't. And it probably shaped a lot of what I was doing, but I'm not a hater on that situation. I think things, different things work for different people. The key piece is just talking about it. Yeah. I do think as we go on in our younger people, I don't, I don't really see a world where it's that commingling of things. I think it will be separate, but still together. Do you guys have to, I mean, this can be like really personal, like marital counseling. Do you guys have to get in the weeds, like helping like that conversation, like advising around that? So like, you're not even to the money yet. You're just on like, how do we manage this between the couple and their conversation around money? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's tricky. Um, yeah. I would say we definitely have to, in a subversive way, manage the unsaid dynamics, yes. right? Um, it's not as explicit uh, in terms of like, okay, let's address the elephant in the room, which is that you are an asshat and you're being very <laughs> controlling, you know? So, so we have to be very, I would say diplomatic in yeah. terms of how, but, but it is and tactical of bringing in the yeah. other person. Cause mm -hmm. that's also hard too. And male or female, there's one person who's doing all the talking, all the guiding, and you can see on the other person's face that they're uncomfortable or they have something to say and you try to bring them in. And it's like dragging a demon out of hell. Like you can't, you yeah. can hardly do it. Mm -hmm. There yeah. is a, there is a designation for, um, like people who are going through a divorce, um, which I think would be really interesting. Um, but before people get to the divorce part, there's definitely still can be, can be tense, a tense dynamic between couples. Yeah. yeah. Who I, I just, I, the psychology, like you said, it's intimate, it's vulnerable, it's personal. And then maybe you kind of bring in a, a situation that's already not stable. Like there's so much therapy degrees that you need to have there to yeah. handle that before you even get to the finances. Um, I think it's really helpful for people to have a moderator. Oh, you know, sure. With, Again, yeah. get the coach, get the yeah. coaches, get the advisors, just mm -hmm. streamline the process. Uh, I did, I saw um, Tom Brady and Giselle broke up and I think people should look at their money and their finances like famous people and get the prenup from the gecko. Like, because mm -hmm. like, think of it, even if it's, you know, a hundred grand or whatever, 50, a thousand dollars, like get your business together just so there's not that fight and that underlying thing. I know it's tricky because then people are like, well, I'll never break up. We don't need that. And I'm like, okay, statistically I'm here. I'm hopeful but let's just do the business. Um, but like they had it done ironclad prenup, no questions asked. Things are simple. It's not hard on the kids. Like there's, I think there's an approach that you don't have to have billions of dollars, which she had way more than him. Let it be known. And, and that's it. And then there was like it streamlined that process. So I don't think you have to have a ton of money to have that conversation either. I celebrate every client we have. That's like, I've gotten a prenup Chandler and I are like good for you. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people stay in relationships because of money. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, kind of gets that out of the way, yeah. you know, if something's not working, just get out. Yeah. Oof. But the thing is, that's why I love this conversation. I think if you can get in stable space around money before any of this, before you're even dating or whatever, like it, this takes, this is like one less thing that can potentially like impact negatively something really important, a relationship in your life. Like this is a big deal. So if you can get ahead of the game and get it right early on. I think that mitigates potential disaster down the road. 
I agree. I think the same goes for intergenerational wealth transfer and um, just it is still to this day. I mean, I always celebrate families that are open and communicative with with their children about expectations around inheritance or planning. Yeah. Like, not even that, just like planning that's been set up for a litany of reasons. But it's still such a, it's just a very hush-hush thing still. Yeah. Hmm. Have you guys seen it change over the years as you've been in the industry? Like, have you seen some evolution or is it pretty slow? I think it's slow. It's money, such a tabooed subject. Mm -hmm. I think what's changing is me having worked in the industry for so long now. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like shame or taboo around it. Cause I just right away, I'm like, Oh, how much money do you make? Like yeah. what, what's going on behind the curtain? Um, for your family members, you mean? No, like clients, but oh, okay. family, I think there's a ton of oh, okay. like taboo. Yeah. I don't think there's been a lot of development yeah. with people outside of our industry really mm -hmm. um I agree I it's agree such too. a hard subject like health and money it's so hard yeah yeah I, I, I'm a big advocate of in the workplace, like women telling each other or men too. So just like, so you know, so it's like, mm, is it, am I getting paid less? Cause I'm female. Like we are literally doing the same. And this happened to several of my friends, um, female and male. And if they were a man of color or, um, LGBTQ plus community, they're women. Like there's been things where they made less because of those factors. And it's hard to like pin it to one thing, but if you're not having those conversations, sometimes you don't know, and you don't know even how much less it can be. So I think in the workplace, I, society, we might not change it, but I, I don't know. I try and, and I'm certainly not a wealth management advisor or anything, but I would say get with your coworkers and find like cultivate that relationship to where you can be honest. So there's transparency in what's going on just to protect yourself more than anything. And then really negotiate on behalf of yourself, yes. too, which is a superpower. Yeah. I love it. Well, I have a hundred more questions for you guys, but I love this. Tell me, um, tell us where we find you guys, um, hit us with all the handles. And then if there is a first step to reach out to you guys, is it email? Is it phone call? Is it what's, what's that best first step? Yeah. You can find us at the naked call is our handle on Instagram and TikTok. currently really working on the TikTok. Not very yes. good at it. <laughs> um, yeah, our email is Chandler at the naked call.com. So you can either email us or go to our website and there's a scheduling link on there and you can find a time that works for you. I love it. Kaiser, do you know, or uh, Kaiser? I'm used to last names in sports. I so you like it. Get, no, like... People call me Kaiser my whole life. So, uh, I love it. You just leaned right into that. Boom. Just, set, just shoot up the bat signal. You don't even need to call them. Just show up at their house, actually. <laughs> um, I love this. Please check out their podcast. Uh, I know uh, they've got some great guests coming out, but I love that you guys are like humanizing the conversation around money and are really being like, uh, you guys are like in the ambassadors of like women in finance. So um, uh, I feel like you'd like pull open the pantsuit a little bit and there's like one of your initials on your chest. So um, no, no pressure at all, but go check <laughs> them out. I appreciate you guys time and energy and hopefully we'll be, I'll be on their show. I think at some point and we'll be doing it in real life. Thank you so much for having us. This has been a delight. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.